welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Allistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest this week is clinical psychologist, Dr. George Simon. Dr. Simon is an internationally recognized expert on manipulators and other problem characters and is the author of many best-selling books, including The Essentials for the Journey, Embracing and Living the Ten Commandments of Character, Proven Principles for a Psychologically Healthy and Spiritually Rich Life. I will be linking Dr. Simon's website down below for your reference. Welcome, Dr. Simon. Thank you, Lisa. Happy to be with you again. Yes, yes. This is actually our second one, and I will be putting our first chat down in the description box if anybody wants to check that out. It was on manipulators and character disturbed people, which, you know, relates to some of what we're going to be talking about today. Fantastic. So um, I checked out your book and I have it right here. If anybody wants to get a copy, it is excellent. Um, so let me ask you, uh, we've been talking about character disturbed people and you have approached it from a spiritual perspective on how to maybe solve this problem in society. Why did you take it from that approach? Okay, well, <clears throat> what I really tried to do rather than just take it from a spiritual perspective is integrate the emotional, the psychological, the character development, the physiological and the spiritual, you know, we're not healthy as human being unless we're healthy in all spheres. So what I really tried to do is bring all the major metaphors together uh, because we live in very trying times where folks uh, seem to be just a bit lost when it comes to really understanding the nature of the uh, relationship problems that we have uh, so abundantly today, too many times relationships fail because people have failed to develop along several lines. They've failed to develop adequately along emotional lines, psychological lines, with respect to their self-image, spiritually, all these aspects of us go together. And um, I don't really o overly weight one metaphor over the other. Uh, as my experience as a therapist over 40 years has taught me, uh, there are many ways of looking at and approaching issues and problems that people have. And uh, I try to make it fit all together. If something is true, really true, it's true within any uh, framework that you want to describe it. Well, I appreciate that you have, you know, dedicated your life's work at addressing this issue on character development. It is an area that is not taught and not talked about enough in our schools, in our families, in society, just in general. And I see character as a multifaceted issue, too, as it's a construct that we've had uh, around for a long time. It's very poorly understood. Um, but it's that aspect of our personality that reflects how well grounded we are to a healthy belief system, how well we've uh, developed a positive sense of self, how well we've learned to regulate ourselves, to regulate our emotions, to conduct ourselves in a healthy way in our relationships. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything we need these days, it's mending of our relationships, mm -hmm. all of our relationships. The world is literally a powder keg and has been for quite some time. And people are a little weary. I'm optimistic, however, because I see hunger everywhere. Mm -hmm. I see people searching for something. And that's why I wrote my latest book, Essentials for the Journey. Uh, I had introduced what I call the Ten Commandments of Character, the, the life axioms, the most important fundamental lessons and principles that a person has to learn in their growth and development, and not only learn, but take to heart in order to be a relatively decent person. I, I felt that I needed to really 
explain in more depth how those principle because how those principles can really uh, help expand one's awareness, how it can bring more fulfillment to one's life, mm -hmm. and how it can really help a person grow in mm -hmm. all the aspects of self that we need to grow to be wholesome individuals and repair, or at least begin to repair all the broken relationships in the world. Yes, most definitely. Not only help the individual, but also future generations, because right. the, we're hoping there's a domino effect of character development improvement that we're seeing, you know, take place in society. And like I said, I'm so glad you're talking about this and that you've laid it out with the Ten Commandments, which I think have a lot of wisdom behind them. And uh, that's what I wanted to kind of break down is these Ten com Commandments. So if people get your book, they can kind of refer back to this video and maybe look a little bit deeper into what you were saying behind each one. Um, so the first one, uh, the first commandment is to expand your awareness. Um, we have all witnessed people with very low self-awareness and it can be very frustrating to have a relationship with somebody like that or to communicate with somebody like that. Maybe at times we have even been guilty of low self-awareness, but if we can recognize it, we can definitely um, address it and and improve upon it. So can you uh, talk a bit about your first commandment? Yes, you know, in our day and time, in the age of narcissism, rampant narcissism, mm -hmm. it's so easy for folks to have tunnel vision, to be self-absorbed in all the wrong ways. Um, and this commandment is really about not just expanding awareness about oneself, but seeing the bigger picture understanding how we're all connected and how we're connected to everything else in this vast universe. This is a marvelous, hardly comprehensible enterprise, this life we lead. But most of us have tunnel vision. Most of us are narrowly focused on what we think yep. will please us at the moment. Our age is a hedonistic, self-centered, egoic age. My goodness, I was watching um, what I could tolerate of the Academy Awards the other <laughs> night. And yeah. I thought to myself, well, now nothing is strange anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we are so self-indulgent and uh, so um, narrow-minded and we have become so tolerant we, we've become, unfortunately, very used to so much character dysfunction that things that would have absolutely outraged us years ago mm -hmm. are no big deal. Mm -hmm. We've developed a certain amount of, 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 of uh, callousness uh, be, as a result. And um, really- Going back to uh, the Academy Awards, we're applauding now that type of behavior. Yes, and, we and rewarding it. And rewarding that type of behavior. Yeah. But the, the sadder part for me is that we have stopped expecting or demanding more, which is exactly why so many relationships fail. Because right from the beginning, right from the beginning, I know this sounds maybe a little harsh, but right from the beginning, we don't expect as much from ourselves and from our potential partners as we used to. And why is that, you think? We become too desensitized in many respects and too used to uh, a narrow, if it pleases me, then I'm going to do it kind of mindset. We've become basically a slave to our more basic desires. I can't tell you the number of people who have told me something like, you know, well, I just had so much fun with this individual, or we just seemed to click, or, or all my friends seemed to be getting hitched and I didn't want to be left behind. All kinds of shallow reasons mm -hmm. um, to get into a relationship. And then surprise, surprise, 
a few years later, uh, they're unhappy. Well, this is the inevitable thing. And you don't, if you don't care enough about yourself or your own personal level of development at the time, and you don't care enough to seriously vet the character of another, ask those tough questions, not accept some of the pat answers about why maybe this potential partner had four failed relationships before you, but mm -hmm. somehow you entertain the fantasy that it's all going to be different because yep. you're so special and mm -hmm. because they say so, and mm -hmm. because it was everybody else's fault anyway, mm -hmm. that things are going to work out. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to expect an awful lot more and nothing in the way of shallowness, callousness, egomania, nothing shocks us anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, one of the things I like that you outlined in the expand your awareness uh, section is that you talked about kind of the dark side of altruism and empathy. Can you touch on that? Yeah, you know, empathy is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But it can have a dark side because there's one thing that empathy deficient folks love, and that's a really empathetic partner. Mm -hmm. They love to use that to their advantage. They know that if they've got a partner that cares, right, mm -hmm. that they're very, uh, it's, it's a fairly easy thing to manipulate that person. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it also, the, the, the even darker side is that when somebody is empathy deficient, whether they have a biological impairment there or whether their rearing was such that they never had to nurture and develop more empathy or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. if somebody exploits somebody else's wonderful ability to be empathetic, to have empathy, mm -hmm. then they never have to grow up. They never have to improve. They never have to do better in their own character development because they've got a willing partner who picks up the trash all the time, who cleans mm -hmm. up the messes, Enabler. Who, who does all the, the caring and enables their character dysfunction. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so um, you talk about being spiritually awakened and how, you know, we are all connected and all our actions affect one another. And so we can be irritated by, you know, the, character disturbed individuals, but the onus comes back on us on how we respond and interact. And if we can raise the awareness around this types of stuff, hopefully we can have, you know, better outcomes. Right. It all starts with that. It starts with expanding our view, getting out of our narrow focus and seeing our place and being mindful, you know, there's a lot of research has been done on mindfulness and its benefits, especially psychologically. But spiritually speaking as well, mindfulness is the key. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a really dramatic event to wake us up. Sometimes the bottom has to fall out. Sometimes we have to endure incredible pain. Mm -hmm. um, but however nature has it planned for us or the universe has it planned for us, almost everyone comes to that point uh, and folks in 12 step groups talk about this of having a true awakening mm -hmm. where all of a sudden they become aware of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. The quicker you can do that, the better for your health. <laughs> yes, and and yes. there are some things you can do to, uh, to usher that kind of awareness in to your life. And it all starts with mindfulness. It all starts with not being on automatic drive, not letting your impulses, your concerns, your worries, your mm -hmm. needs drive you, mm -hmm. but rather being aware of those things and being mindful. Of, okay, so I've got this concern. Let me sit with it a while. Mm -hmm. Let me expand my awareness of, of, about it. What do I really need to do? What would be in my best interest? What would be in the best interest of all concerned, all those I'm connected with? Mm -hmm. 
that kind of mindfulness is key to all facets of mm -hmm. personal health. Yeah. What a difference it would make if we would just all do that at the start of our day or just have like five minutes set aside at the middle of the day that you're just like checking in with yourself and making sure that you are, you know, in honor with what your principles are. Well, you just said a mouthful right there. There's <laughs> absolutely a ton of research that suggests that just taking a few minutes at the mm -hmm. start of every day mm -hmm. to center oneself makes a huge difference because most of the day we're letting all of the things we think we need to do drive us. Mm -hmm. We're on automatic pilot, pretty mm -hmm. much doing this and doing that, 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 the, that our, uh, our, our peers at work or our bosses or our kids or all the other circumstances in our life tell us we have to do to get mm -hmm. by and get through the day. And yeah. so kind of like in a machine like fashion, we just mm -hmm. do this and we do that without a heck of a lot of mindfulness. Right, right. Very good. So let's move on to the second commandment, which I think is a very good value is um, being grateful. Can you touch on that? Yeah. Uh, and this seems like a, a trite commandment. Uh, and it also seems sometimes insensitive because if you look around, there are some folks who, at least materially speaking, don't seem to have a whole lot to feel grateful for. Mm -hmm. But this commandment is really all about countering the age of entitlement. Mm -hmm. Part of waking up is appreciating the fact that this great gift of life is just that. It's a gift. It's totally unearned. I mean, you could even address that logically. You can even address that with your mind. Everybody knows that they didn't cause their own existence, right? And even if you trace your physical existence to the parents who participated in the creative act that brought you here, mm -hmm. Even the forces that drove them to do that are part of the universe's plan. This is a big enterprise. And th this mad, fantastic experience that we call life is not earned, it's given. And what we make of it matters. How we regard the gift matters. So we were talking about the age of entitlement and how that entitled mindset the entitled mindset invites chronic episodes of disappointment when you yeah. don't get what you think you deserve. Mm -hmm. And um, there's just powerful evidence developing. Robert Emmons is one of the pioneering researchers. There's powerful evidence developing that when we act in gratitude, when we head on face those attitudes of entitlement that are so prevalent in our times. And not only have the heart for some appreciation for all we do have, including that precious breath that's granted to us each and every day that we happen to be alive. But then when we act in gratitude, when we sense some kind of obligation to give of ourselves and express that gratitude, oh my goodness, what a different life opens up for us. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think if you could just take, uh, you know, again, five minutes in the day when you're practicing mindfulness and write down five things you're grateful for. And it could be as simple as you know, the sun is shining, you know, or, you know, I have a roof over my head or I'm able to walk, you know, just what, five things that you're grateful for and focus on that because it's easy to spiral down and exactly. we want to spiral up. <laughs> right. So this compant, this commandment has two components to it. One is just, as you said, count your blessings, you know, that mm -hmm. old phrase, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. Once you've counted those blessings, it's about expressing the gratitude. Mm -hmm. That is life changing. It opens you up. It's freeing in a sense. And you have, 
uh, there's no way I can explain this in detail. Uh, these, these commandments that I write about, you kind of get them mm -hmm. as you do them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to divert for just a little bit because there's this wonderful paradigm that's existed in psychology now for the last 30 years called the cognitive behavioral paradigm, where we realized about 30 years ago how intimately connected our thinking process was to our behavior so that if we would look at things a different way, it, it would have an effect on our behavior. And most therapists and most people in troubled relationships understand this relationship, but they approach it the wrong way. Most therapists and most people in troubled relationships will, lace, will waste countless hours, time and energy pleading with people to change their minds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the in the hopes that in changing their attitude or seeing things differently, they will behave differently. Mm -hmm. It works in reverse. You do differently and it changes you. It changes your attitude and it changes your thinking. Somebody much wiser than me said it's a lot more powerful mm -hmm. and a lot more effective. And it's actually easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Mm -hmm. And in my workshops, when I'm training professionals as well as lay, lay people, I hammer that point a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have these so-called commandments. They're action-oriented things. Do this and you will see. Mm -hmm. You know, in, uh, in, um, in uh, surgical uh, studies in school, in med school, there's an axiom, see one, do one, teach one. Mm -hmm. You can explain, you can look in books, you can read all about how to do a certain procedure, surgical procedure. You can explain to a student over and over again verbally what they should do, but until you see it and until you do it, mm -hmm. you don't know it. And mm -hmm. then once you know it, you can teach it. You can mm -hmm. pass it on to the next person, mm -hmm. right? Yep. By inviting them, by inviting them to participate. Mm -hmm. Doing is learning. Mm -hmm. Talking, as they say, is cheap. And it's yes. not very effective. Yes. This reminds me of an analogy that I use with regard to exercise. If I'm always waiting for a feeling to wash over me to make me want to exercise, I could be waiting forever. forever. So I have to go do yes. the behavior first and exactly. the attitude will follow. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So number three is keep a right head about you. Can yes. you touch on that? Well, so hard in our narcissistic age, but... You know, I say you're neither an insignificant speck, nor are you so essential to the universe that it would cease to exist without you. Right. You know, uh, and so it works much differently than we've thought with self-esteem. For years, uh, the pop psychology of the 70s and the 80s, even starting in the late 60s, was all about you can never have too much self-esteem. Oh, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when you see inflated self-esteem, it's not necessarily a compensation for underlying feelings of insecurity. Some people think all too much of themselves and right from the beginning. They've mm -hmm. been pampered, indulged, they've become overly expectational, and as a result, they don't develop a balanced sense of self. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this on the world stage, we're seeing what happens when someone who thinks way too much of themselves, mm -hmm. and we still make the same assumptions, we still say underneath it all, they must be very brittle or insecure. No, 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 no. Some people really sincerely believe that they're all that and mm -hmm. they're trouble. And when we afford them the reins of power, they do horrible things mm -hmm. because they believe that they are entitled and can and should. Mm -hmm. So 
developing a right sense of self, a balanced sense of self is probably pivotal. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's the third commandment. Yes, yes. Some people, like you say, are legends in their own mind. Yes. <laughs> They're very uh, ego. I didn't invent that statement, but it comes from a great mentor of mine, yes. Yes, yes. So we have to keep a balanced sense of self, self-worth. Um, and uh, again, like you said, talked about the, the self-esteem and the unearned self-esteem versus the self-respect that we get from doing things um, is much needed with this uh, commandment. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. The next one is be honest. Simply be honest with yourself and others. Yeah. Touch on that. I phrased this. I thought about how to phrase this for a long time. I phrased this as having the utmost reverence for the truth. We don't revere too many things these days, but if there's anything that deserves reverence, reverence is akin to awe standing in awe of the power and value of something. And the truth is just that. It's the powerful grower, mm -hmm. if we dare to face it. But the truth is hard to face many times. And we are great self deceivers. We like to fool ourselves. And we do it for a reason. It's because it's easier. It's because it's easier. Mm -hmm. Facing cold, hard realities and doing the work that it's necessary many times in life to grow is not very appealing, especially when we already feel overly burdened. Mm -hmm. So it's just much easier to kid ourselves. It's much easier to engage in fantasy and say, you know, things will be better. Mm -hmm. Or I can just ignore it and it'll go away, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. But I noticed, all, yeah, some ahead. people will take their, um, they'll have an intuitive gut feeling about something. It's not right. Something's not right, but you would rather suppress and repress than, uh, you know, uh, confront that person because to confront that person might be to confront the truth and you would rather stay in your fantasy with that person. Right. So Sometimes well, we know and the even, truth. even more daunting than that is if you're confronting a person with, with whom it does no good to confront anyway, because mm -hmm. they're uh, too infantile in their own development and have no, no motivation to change, mm -hmm. um, to be honest with your intuition and with your gut about what needs to change, and then to take on the burden of doing what you need to do to change your circumstances because you're dealing with somebody who has no motivation to change. Mm -hmm. That's even harder still. It's much easier to live in the land of denial. And we used to think of denial as a purely unconscious uh, process to help us guard against unbearable emotional pain. The kind of denial that we engage in these days more often it's just a, a subtle form of lying to ourselves mm -hmm. because it's easier than all the work we know we need to do you know we might be for example really feeling smothered disrespected all sorts of unhealthy ways in a relationship and we know that it's not healthy mm -hmm. but to carve out a different path to rebuild mm -hmm um to self-examine when we're already burdened with all these other things that's not an attractive po uh, proposition mm -hmm. but if we're really going to love ourselves if we're really going to love the way the universe wants us to become the lovers that we're capable of and mm -hmm. that starts with us mm -hmm. then there's a burden that comes along with that mm -hmm. i'm not talking about love as an attraction or love as tender feelings. I'm talking about love as the ultimate evolved human behavior that we're mm -hmm. all capable of, mm -hmm. but is not easy. Yes, yes. We have to really, you know, acknowledge our mistakes and, and have humility around this particular commandment because 
you know, you, you talk about how the truth will set you free, you know, yeah. from a spiritual standpoint. And if you want to be in connection with source or whatever that looks like for you, you have to be honest because the lies will catch up eventually. The lies will make you sick. It yes. will make the people around you sick. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is this this one, this commandment is huge, and it is interrelated to the other ones as well. Yes. Well, they're all interrelated. Mm -hmm. And the next three that, that we'll talk about are very closely related because they all have to do with self, not just self-discipline, but self-management in so many different ways. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's move on to number five. Number five is take charge. Yes, take charge and master your appetites and aversions. This is pivotal. You know, we are pretty much slaves to our appetites, the things that please us. Um, this is the um, this is the beginning of addiction. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true with shying away from the things that displease us. We don't want to face the unpleasant. This is natural. This is not abnormal. We want to gravitate towards those things that give us some kind of pleasure. And mm -hmm. we want to avoid those things that cause us some pain. Yep. <laughs> but sometimes in life, if we're going to grow, the very thing that is tempting to us is the very thing we should avoid. Mm -hmm. And the very thing that makes us uncomfortable is the very thing that we need to learn to master. You know, I can't tell you how disheartening it is to have the person who was responsible, the researcher, the key researcher who was responsible for pointing out that some kids have a really tough time learning to st sit still in school and mm -hmm. pay attention and go through their boring assignments. It, it means a lot that that person who said, you know what, these kids need help, they're desperate, and we should tend to that. This person said, oh my God, we've gone too far the other way. We've created a whole generation of children who don't know what it's like to sit with some discomfort and to master it and to uh, do the difficult, to basically make themselves do the difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not growing. So, you know, a balance has to be struck there. We have to be the master of our appetites and aversions. If not, they will master us. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, so yes, you talk about in this chapter, something called a motivational syndrome. Yes. Can you touch on that? Yeah, there's too many of us who, uh, and this is a syndrome that was originally associated with chronic marijuana users. Mm -hmm. And there's some doubts about the validity of that uh, as, as initially constructed. But there are some folks who just simply struggle with motivation because they say to themselves, basically, what's in this for me? What's the point? <laughs> what's the point? It doesn't particularly please me. And you see how all these commandments fit together right from the first one where this person who says that can't possibly see themselves as part of a big picture. Mm -hmm. And they can't possibly be grateful for all the gifts and have come to sense some kind of indebtedness to mm -hmm. use those gifts to put back to put back into the world. But I mean, this is so important um, that we mm -hmm. that we integrate all of these things, mm -hmm. see the bigger picture, find the motivation to give of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in the process, the universe the universe gives back tenfold. Mm -hmm. What we get back for appropriately giving our, of ourselves, even when there doesn't seem to be an immediate payoff or reward, when mm -hmm. we stop asking what's in it for me, how is this gonna please me? When we stop asking those questions and mm -hmm. simply give, what we get back eventually is tenfold. Yes, yes, very good, yes, because you know, pleasure seeking only goes so far. A lot of people, you know, like you said, will end up with certain addictions, whether it's an addiction to food or video games or shopping or alcohol, whatever it might be. Those are such temporary disassociated states that you are in. 
that eventually it will either kill you, ruin you, um, not have a satisfying life. And so I think people need to really distinguish what is going to truly bring them happiness. And some of these pleasure seeking aversions that we do don't bring true happiness. Right. And this is why I have hope because mm -hmm. with any addictive behavior like that, you get enough of what you're really searching, searching for what you're really seeking. You get enough of it to keep you coming back. That's the very nature of addiction. Even if it's an addiction in a relationship, an addiction mm -hmm. to a person, say for example, <laughs> I know a lot of folks who hooked up with folks that I call charming ego massage artists. <laughs> These are folks who know, who, who can spot the um, needs you might have for mm -hmm. affirmation and know how to charm you and to give you a little taste of that mm -hmm. when it serves their purpose. So you get enough of that, mm -hmm. that you keep coming back, even though a part of you says in your gut, you know what, mm -hmm. this person is not helping me grow. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the nature of any addiction. You get enough of something to keep mm -hmm. you coming back, but it's not what you really need. Mm -hmm. Yes. You talk about the three tests of character where you have an adversity, a temptation, and then power over that. Right. So I think that was a great example in the dating world that sometimes people have to realize, man, I've been dating some really bad characters. Um, we see this sometimes with the, in the literature with the dark triad, um, young women being maybe drawn to the dark triad traits in their right. younger years. And then with experience and wisdom, they're like, oh, those are like the worst type of men to be mating with and to be having relationships with. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in our hedonistic um, and uh, short sighted kind of environment, uh, it's hard to get out of that mindset. But I do sense a hunger in folks. I know so many folks that are appeased in one sense, but are still so very hungry and they know they're hungry. Mm -hmm. um, they want more. Their soul yearns for more mm -hmm. and they need to pay that yearning some respect, you mm -hmm. know, heed that call. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay. So moving on to number six, which is be prudent. Yes. Uh, thinking before you act, weighing things. And it's not just thinking before you act because what you think matters, how you think mm -hmm. matters, right? Yep. How you evaluate things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, basically uh, not just being um, mindful of your uh, appetites and aversions, but um, being mindful about what the impact of your behavior is likely to be uh, mm -hmm. as you contemplate an action. So really taking the time to sort through all your motivations, be honest with yourself about what's driving you, um, and then act. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And, and along the lines with this is um, maturity. I think, you know, maybe when we're younger, we might respond with jokes or other coping mechanisms that don't really help the situation. So I think uh, being prudent, you have to gain mastery over your impulses and being mature in your um, responses. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, number seven is be rightfully purposed and disciplined. Yes, this is all about will. Uh, this is all about recognizing that as human beings, and there's a lot of research about this on both sides. There are some researchers who uh, who claim that this whole concept of free will is overplayed. And there are other researchers that say just the opposite. But we human beings have the capacity to evaluate our circumstances and make decisions. And the kinds of decisions we make matter. How we exercise our wills matter. In this commandment, I talk about two essential things. One is developing a will strong enough 
that you can make decisions that are in your best interest and in the interest of others. Mm -hmm. So a will, like anything else, like any other human capacity, with practice, anything can be strengthened. Mm -hmm. And our will is a human capacity, and we can strengthen it with practice. However, I mentioned a little joke uh, in that chapter. I tell the story of a, a person uh, driving in the street uh, along the streets of New York who pulls up uh, next to a cabbie whose window is down and says, excuse me, sir, can you tell me how I get to Carnegie Hall? And the wise cabbie says, practice, my child, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Right. It's a joke, but it has great truth in it there. If you really want to have the willpower necessary mm -hmm. to help you resist temptations, to help you make better decisions, you have to first strengthen your will. Once it's strengthened, it has to be rightly purposed. In other words, you have to direct it wisely. Now, there are some folks that have an advantage in that they tend to be innately strong willed, right? Mm -hmm. So a strong will by itself won't get you anywhere. As anyone who's raised kind of a hard headed, willful child, strong willed child knows, mm -hmm. uh, they may be very, very determined right from the get go, but that doesn't mean they're going to make the right call. Mm -hmm. So that there's two aspects that go together. Being mindful of your purpose, and having the strength to carry it out. Very good, very good. Um, okay, so moving on to number eight, and that is fight right, be assertive and assert yourself. Yes. We are, uh, we are an aggressive species. We are. Mm -hmm. Our history reflects that. Yes. And this instinct was given to us for a reason. There are some times when it's absolutely essential that we fight. Mm -hmm. Now, how we do it, how we do it makes all the difference. The folks that I have in my past works called the aggressive personalities, they seek power for its own sake, uh, selfishly, uh, they inevitably abuse it when they have it. They f fight for strictly self-serving purposes. Uh, they uh, seek positions of dominance merely to dominate in their relationships. So why and how we fight matters. And when we fight for something bigger than us, when we fight for just loving causes and when we take care to fight in disciplined ways that don't needlessly injure others but only advance a noble cause this is the core of what we call assertiveness and there's perhaps no human capacity more important than that mm -hmm. uh, all too many folks learn this the hard way who have been in uh, what we sometimes call codependent relationships. That, that term is so misused. I, I, we could spend an entire program on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're really talking about is relationships where one person wields way too much uh, power and mm -hmm. seeming authority and the other person uh, exceeds to those demands um, and as a result becomes inordinately emotionally dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and what they really need more than anything is the courage and the experience to fight right mm -hmm. for themselves, for their legitimate wants and needs, and to do that in a way that serves everybody mm -hmm. because they're serving a principle fighting for a principle as opposed to just fighting for a position of dominance in a relationship. Mm -hmm. 
I've noticed that in interactions with character, character disturbed individuals, they only do uh, relationships in a vertical manner. They're here and you're here. And if you try to get on a you know balanced horizontal level, it doesn't work. They'll either leave or they'll try to push you back down. So right, right there should, should be a sign if you're in a relationship or dealing with somebody where it's vertical versus horizontal. Right. You just mentioned what I hammer to attendees at workshops uh, all the time. I make the analogy that in real estate, they say three things matter, location, location, location and location. Yeah. And with disturbed character, there's only three things that matter position, position, mm -hmm. and position. And you're right. So long as they're here and you're here, everything's mm -hmm. fine. Now mm -hmm. try to level the playing field or maybe even get a leg up occasionally and you've got real trouble. They'll punish you for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so with the, this one, I think it's really important to understand boundaries. Um, you will find some, you know, bullies act very cowardless and will cross people's boundaries. That's not fair fighting. Um, we have to respect our own boundaries in a fair fight. And um, those are definitely really important, I think, with this command. Yes, and you mentioned the coward cowardice of, mm -hmm. of bullies. I want to say that that's been our traditional notion. Abundant research has proven what I learned long time ago, and that is the primary reason bullies bully is not because they're too cowardly mm. to fight fairly. It's because they enjoy it. Mm. It's easy and, Sadistic. For them, it, and for them, it's fun. Mm. Now that's even sicker, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. closer to the truth than they're too afraid to fight fairly. They do it for sport, for entertainment. They do it for sport, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we see these acts of aggression, um, you know, in physical uh, realms with war, mass shootings, but also in emotional realms with like the cancel culture, people going after people's reputations. Right. And um, so we see this type of aggression in lots of ways that it's playing out. Right, and so, this again, it shows how all the commandments work together. They feel entitled to do it. So they haven't met, mastered the second commandment, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah. And so one of the things you talk about how to spiritually address this is to convert hearts. Can you touch yeah. on that? Yes. This is how we change the world. This is how we change the world. One heart at a time, starting with our own. Which just goes into number nine, be yes. kind. Yes. Yeah, which is about treating others with civility and generosity, mm -hmm. to be kind and generous. Mm -hmm. And it's that very behavior, especially when it's difficult, that makes a difference. Uh, I'll, I'll go back, we'll use the example of the uh, awards. You know, uh, I have a lot of respect, actually, for uh, the way that the person who had every reason to be offended. Um, Chris Rock. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I have every re, uh, bit of respect for what I thought was a relatively classy manner. But and he had to. He was on a stage. Would it have he, been no, he different? Did, he didn't Why? have to. That that's that that kind of discounts um, character. He didn't have to. Just as the other person didn't have to respond the way they did. And by the way, there's some background to that that a lot of people aren't aware of. Yeah. Days earlier, days earlier, an interview was given in which um, the person who was supposedly offended, Jada Pinkett Smith, mm -hmm. said that she was used to people poking fun. Mm -hmm. her, her words were literally, I don't give two craps about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't phase me. It doesn't bother me blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I'm immune to being offended. And we only saw what we saw on our cameras, but foreign cameras that were there caught some very different things mm -hmm. from the initial laughter on both parts to the manipulative, the manipulative looking offended, and then the glaring glance toward her partner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that may have been part of the prompt there. Mm -hmm. Yes. All reflecting all kinds of games that character impaired people play. 
like making it about themselves on a big night where you win the Oscars. Right. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by the way, um, we now know that uh, uh, the offender was asked to leave and refused to do so mm -hmm. and acted like nothing had happened. Right. right. Well, that's Hollywood privilege, elite privilege is that being played out, you know. Well, and also this is also on all of us because we have become all too tolerant mm -hmm. of what used to outrage us. We used to ask more of ourselves and mm -hmm. of others. And we used to, in many cases, demand it. I can remember, I am not, I know I'm old. I am, I'm 74, so I'm, I'm old. I'm officially a geezer, <laughs> you know? You're, you're wise. And I can remember when it mattered enough to a sports team that it, irrelevant of how much talent you had and how much of a prospect you could bring to a team that they mm -hmm. might win a pennant or a, a league a championship, it mattered to the team that if you could possibly bring disgrace upon the team, that you weren't getting on the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, Character mattered. Yes, yes. And going back to the, the eight, number eight, with regards to this, I think um, there's a term in psychology called displacement or displaced aggression, displaced anger. And I saw that in Will. Because if you know the true backstory of his and Jada's relationship, right? I think it was displaced anger that he put on Chris, which should have been directed to her. Right. Now, by the way, mm -hmm. talk about position, positioning in relationships and abusive relationships. Yeah. We tend in psychology and even in assessment and even in the public perception, when females have certain character characteristics, we tend to see them differently than when mm. men display the exact same characteristics. Mm -hmm. And most of the readers in my, of my books are females who are dealing with impaired characters in their male partners. Mm -hmm. that's, mo that's mostly the case. But I have to tell you, all the characteristics are the same when you're dealing with females, but we mm -hmm. tend to see them differently. Mm. Yeah. Do we, we tend to excuse them away or? We will we not just excuse them. We tend to see their behavior differently from what it is. Mm. Talk about a manipulative, mm -hmm. abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's getting a little better. I think people are becoming more aware and educated to these type of relationships. Thank God. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, Will gets the help and gets the realization and one day can really dissect that situation as other people are truly seeing it. He wants to be the hero. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the hero. And unfortunately for him, she knows that. Oh, yeah. She's got her claws in him. Oh, she can God. play him like a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is we tend, unfortunately to view that kind of dynamic differently when it occurs with females. We still have a bias. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, professionals will diagnose differently too. Mm -hmm. you, and you, courts. You list, you list all of the same criteria. We've done research on this. Mm -hmm. You list all the same criteria that would lead to an antisocial personality disorder in a man, and mm -hmm. you get all kinds of diagnoses for a female other than antisocial. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to number, um, well, saying on number nine, one thing I wanted to approach was that you talked about the golden rule, treat others as if how you would want them to treat you. But yeah. what if it's different? What if I have an opinion of how I wanted to be treated is not how you think I should be treated? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's why I say that basically that that rule only goes so far. What we want to do is not be the person that offends us, not be the person that demonstrates bad character toward us. We can easily become 
the person that we have an issue with. And we don't want to do that. We want to be true to ourselves and our core. And it all starts with the earlier commands. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, this is very fun, but it's deeply spiritual, but you have to know at a very deep level, not only your worth, but where that worth comes from, mm -hmm. where it derives. If we weren't meant to be here, we wouldn't be here. The universe has given birth to you for a reason. Everything and everyone belongs. But uncovering that, finding your purpose, how you fit, developing the mindfulness to even care about that mm -hmm. is all part of it. These commandments all work together. You can't get to this commandment to be kind and generous unless you've mastered all the ones before it. Yes, yes. They all as work we, together. As well and as then, number... Then that brings us to the last one, right? Yes, number 10 is about being genuinely well-intended. Love and love often. So I think that's so important um, is being genuine with yourself. I know that if, for example, if I'm communicating with somebody who's being insincere with me, I'll stop all communication right. because there's no point in trying to communicate with the insincere. Right. Um, so I think it's real important to like notice that, notice when people aren't being genuine with you and don't waste your time with them. Right. Now, I make the point, however, mm -hmm. that sincerity is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. I know plenty of despicable characters who are exactly who they say they are and who present themselves exactly as they are, and who are sincerely legends in their own minds, mm -hmm. and who are sincerely very willing to dominate in a relationship. Uh, I, I think they do that to test you. If I tell you how awful I am up front, that I'm a bad guy or whatever, and you stay around, then they feel, you know, vindicated. Yeah. Well, sometimes they do it to test you, but sometimes they just don't really care mm -hmm. um, because it's it it this you can't get to this commandment unless you've come to appreciate that there's something bigger than you. Mm -hmm. So there's two things that lead you to really embrace this last commandment and really understand the essential requirements of love. It's one thing to have the awareness that there's something much bigger. It's another thing to have developed the heart to put yourself and your life at the very service of that something bigger. Look at what you're doing, for example. I've, I've met with you a couple of times now. I've talked with you otherwise. Look at what you're trying to do with your life. Are you just trying to enrich yourself? Trying to help others as well. I'm hoping this helps one person. <laughs> it's what it's all about. Yeah. That's what defines love. It's not just about the caring. It's about serving something that's bigger and it has its own rewards. Are you likely to get filthy rich because of it? Mm -hmm. Probably not, but mm -hmm. Will you be enriched and will you enrich mm -hmm. the lives of others? More than likely. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So you kind of end your book talking about constructing a better world inside out. out. Can you touch on that? It starts with you. Mm -hmm. You know, character is contagious. It really is. We've forgotten how contagious it is. We've forgotten how valuable it is. I call my podcast Character Matters for a reason. Mm -hmm. It matters. It matters whether we think it matters or not. It matters whether we care to acknowledge it or not. And it will matter like it once mattered again when we decide to make it matter. When we decide that making of ourselves the best person that we can be not only profits us, but profits everybody. Mm -hmm. 
It brings healing to the world. It helps repair the damage that decades of hedonism, egocentricity, tunnel vision, selfishness, mm -hmm. indulgence, and especially entitlements. We've had decades of this. We've gotten so woefully desensitized and used to this that we just think it normal. So when someone in the highest office in the land behaves like a four year old, we think, and worse than that, worse than that, if they will serve our selfish interests, we give it a pass. Mm -hmm. Shame on us. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that, the uh, mob mentality, just not critically thinking and going along with the mob. Well, and placing our agendas mm -hmm. and, 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 and principles that we, we, we believe in sincerely mm -hmm. ahead of character, which in the end never works out, mm -hmm. never works out. We are seeing right now on the world stage, what happens when someone of a more egomaniacal character has the reins of power. You're talking about Putin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. We should know better, but we don't know better. Mm -hmm. We don't know better. Mm -hmm. And we don't care enough yet to learn. But history will be our teacher. Experience mm -hmm. will be our teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the 12 step groups, they say, they talk about getting sick and tired of being sick, sick and mm -hmm. tired. There comes surrendering. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. there comes that point where we just have to say, you know what, we can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nature has a way of correcting us. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is look at the history of, you know, civilizations that have collapsed. Yes. This is no different. We could mm -hmm. be in a civilization collapse right now, but right. something better hopefully will come out of it. Yes. Most yeah. definitely. Well, thank you, Dr. Simon. I appreciate you coming on my channel and sharing your insights to the Ten Commandments. I really appreciate the book. And if you guys make sure you get it, it's a good one. I, they have it all on his website. On um, I got this on Amazon. Uh -huh. um, I highly recommend it. And we're and, working on the audio version. I get requests every day for the audio version. And I have people asking me all the time if I will narrate it. If I didn't have these vocal cord issues, I... I might actually consider that, but we're working on it. Oh, interesting. You know, I, I was listening to another audiobook where somebody else was the narrator, but then at the end of every chapter, they did an interview with the author so that you can give more insight to that chapter. So that oh. might be an option as well that you might want to look at. Excellent. What an yeah. idea. Thank you very much for that idea. Yes, you're welcome. And uh, if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Tell us which uh, commandment really spoke to you. And uh, maybe Dr. Simon will jump on there and respond as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching.